the New York Times Magazine published an article titled, Why Isn't the U.S. Better at Predicting Extreme Weather? The article, very critical of the National Weather Service and its forecasting of dangerous weather events like hurricanes, including Hurricane Matthew. And joining us now live is the uh, author of that article, Michael Baer. He's in Boulder, Colorado right now. Michael, thank you for being with us. We talk about your article. You know, we talked a lot about model forecasting and, and how there, there appears to be this huge disparagement between a, a U.S. model and a European model, and this perception that Europeans are, are much more well advanced in forecasting than Americans are. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I mean, part of it is because the European Center has focused virtually all of its resources on building one really good weather model versus what we've done here in the U.S. is, is sort of scatter them among almost a dozen models, none of which really work that well. And, and Michael, based on you know, what you have looked at, what, what is the implication of, of the inferior U.S. models for, for the recent hurricane seasons? Well, one thing that it's difficult for them to get correct is change in intensity of a hurricane. And, and and this was pretty clear in Matthew when it was approaching Haiti, the, the, the National Hurricane Center was forecasting that it would not intensify from a category one within about 12 to 24 hours. The next morning it went from a one to a five in about 23 hours. So that was way off base. And if that had happened off the coast of Florida, for instance, then you would have six and a half million people basically trapped under a Category 5 storm. I guess the question is, though, is any, are any of these computer models getting that right? Did any of the computer models see the rapid and strengthening of Matthew? Some of them did a little better, but really the issue of the article is that we, we could in the U.S. be doing a lot better. It's not really technology that's hamstringing the forecasting. The technology is there and the research is out there and much of it is done. It just hasn't been integrated into the forecasting offices for the people who do the day-to-day -day forecasting. Those are known as operational forecasters. And, you know, reading the article, I, I saw you had mentioned uh, spending some time at the National Weather Service in Boulder, and you, you mentioned that the forecaster issued a severe thunderstorm alert, which I assume was a severe thunderstorm warning because they don't issue alerts. Do you think this just goes to show that perhaps maybe it's the public that doesn't quite understand what the National Weather Service is doing or has unrealistic expectations of what they should be telling them? Well, part of it is a little bit of a communication problem from the forecasting offices because a lot of times big storms get hyped early on, but what isn't, what isn't included in those forecasts is the uncertainty of the forecast. So a few days ago in the Pacific Northwest, there was predicted a very, very large storm, almost hurricane strength winds, to hit the Seattle area. Within about 24 hours, it was clear that wasn't going to happen. But in the interim, that had already been splashed all over the headlines. And everyone was expecting this sort of monster storm, which never materialized. And what wasn't really communicated to the public was the fact that there was a lot of uncertainty in this forecast. And, and, and forecasters on television like to sort of latch on to these big, huge events and, and, and the headlines that go with them. We asked the uh, National Weather Service to join us here on the Weather Channel, and we got this statement from them. They weren't able to appear. They say this, we were interviewed a year and a half ago for this article, and a lot of progress has been made since then to fully understand the complexities involved in weather modeling and forecasting requires a deeper intellectual curiosity and closer, more thorough examination than the author was able to accomplish in his article. It fails to accurately capture the state of weather modeling and it ignores the progress that the National Weather Service and our partners have made over the past several years in providing communities with more accurate and timely forecasts. Michael, what do you make of the Weather Service's statement? I would like you to ask them exactly what progress they're talking about. What they've done in the last year and a half is had a lot of committees and a lot of meetings talking about what they should do or what they could do, but nothing has been instituted. After Hurricane Sandy, they got you know, many, almost $20 million to upgrade their computer system. It took them somewhere around nine or 10 months just to decide on what computers to get. They finally were supposed to get them installed last December. They finally got them online in January. And as of now, most of the space in the computers isn't even being used. So they had almost two years to figure out what to put on these supercomputers. And now that they're online, they still don't know what to put on them. So I would argue 
yes, they've been working toward the problem, but nothing has changed, nothing. Michael, in defense of the, the National Weather Service here, their track forecast the past 25 years, 72-hour track forecast for hurricanes, have gone from 300 miles to 75 miles. Our best intensity forecasts out there, models out there, out there right now, are U.S.-based American models. The h wharf model last hurricane season, in fact, for the last three years, has performed best. The European model that you reference in your article has actually performed the worst in terms of predicting hurricane intensity of the past three years. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, my article was not just about hurricanes. Hurricanes are one element, and and there's there's a lot of other types of weather than hurricanes. Hurricanes, as you know, this are very very rare in the U.S. So the other thing is you're focusing on on tracks, and we're actually pretty good at, at getting hurricane tracks right. What we're not good at is forecasting intensity changes and storm surge changes. Michael, I want to resume this conversation with you by asking you this question. You, you, you touch on a lot of things when it comes to major disaster forecasting, when it comes to thunderstorm forecasting, two very different things. And you say that the Europeans have a, a sole model that they've focused on. But is that really realistic? What, can, a, can a global model really forecast a hurricane and something as small as a tornado at the same time? Don't we need multiple models? And that's why the Weather Service has done that? Well, I think what you have to look at is is something called resolution, and, and it's you know it, it's somewhat like a digital image. The higher the resolution, the clearer the picture you get of the weather. And and you could run a model at a very high resolution, which would give you very local, small forecasts for for things like thunderstorms, which are generally called mesoscale events. Or you can run it at a global level, and and it just depends on how many times a day you want to run it, how high of resolution you want to do it at. All of that is possible. It's a lot of it is just a matter of but, having. But Michael, in your article, you make the you make the argument that the Europeans are superior. However, does the European model? The European model doesn't have the resolution for something like a thunderstorm, like say the high resolution rapid refresh model that's run here in the United States. They're not even close. They can't compare. No, they're not, and, and that's not their job. That's not what they do. They're a global modeling. They have a global modeling system, and that's what their area is. Domestically is where we should be doing high resolution, and you're talking about high resolution rapid refresh or the HER, which you know is performance is sort of questionable. I know what you're referring to, and that we were going to discuss that in the article, but unfortunately we didn't have space. Um, but but that is something we 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 would do domestically anyways, and we're not. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, the local forecasters. You said something like, well, that's what the local forecasters latch on to. Do you think it's uh, perhaps a communication problem rather than a problem with the science? Uh, do you, you know, because the National Weather Service forecasters, you know, we might read their forecast discussion. A lot of the general public then relies on their local forecasters to get that information. Perhaps could this maybe be more of an issue based on the local forecasters? Well, if local forecasters had time, you know, plenty of time to incorporate their local knowledge of area and how the climate may be unique to where they are, they they could change that. I, I was really referring to how sort of storms get hyped in advance when they're thought to be major storms. But it's more than just a communications issue. There's a company out there called Forecast Advisor, which tracks the accuracy of weather forecasts day by day, comparing what the forecast was to what really happened. And you can just plug in your zip code. I just plugged in mine here in, in Boulder, and it says last month, and in fact, the Weather Channel was right 76% of the time, and the National Weather Service was right 42% of the time. And that's just comparing statistics with temperature and precipitation. And so clearly, it's more than just a, a communication problem. But Michael, is there a little bit of cherry picking going on here? I mean, you can you can choose any storm, you can choose any situation to get the statistics to fit what you want. I mean, the, the reality of it is that, you know, for severe weather, which is sort of the crux of your article here, is that the United States has some of the best forecasters in the world for hurricanes, for tornadoes. Do you take issue with that with that statement? I think the point I was trying to get across in the article, you know, I have to cherry pick. I only have limited space in the article, so I have to use what information I have to convey the ideas. But I think the bigger point in the article is, as I dug into this deeper, I found that the operational forecasters of the National Weather Service are, are fantastic people and working really hard with what they have. And all the researchers who are developing the technology to make forecasting better are brilliant, and they're doing some amazing work, a lot of it occurring here at Boulder at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. 
The problem is, is the research is not getting into the hands of the operational forecasters. And in fact, these guys actually have a word for it. They call it the valley of death. And, and the valley of death is this idea that something in research never can cross this valley of death and get into operations. And really, that's sort of a management problem. Okay. It's not really a technological issue. Michael, so, is it, so we just have like 20 seconds left here. So is the issue less about the U.S. lacking in science, but more it's a bureaucracy issue? Yes, that's precisely. The U.S. has the science. They're just not leveraging it. And they haven't been for two and a half decades. Michael Bihar his article in New York Times Magazine. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. Excellent discussion, and I think, you know, you, we have these discussions, maybe they're uncomfortable, but maybe it pushes us to a place where we all have great forecasts and great models available to us in the future.